MCR3U Unit 1 test. So in this test I'm going to check to see how much you learned in the chapter. It, it is a bit challenging for grade 11s because it is absolutely new material for you. I will put a link to a practice test for you to download. It might be just a little bit different because um, I couldn't find the exact same one but it's pretty darn close. Okay so let's get going here. And if you, um, if you don't download it, you can always just stop and um, write yourself some notes on the side and see if you're getting the material right. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It um, gives me an idea of how many people are actually watching the channel. It also really helps for um, Google standings so people find my, my um, channel faster. And if you've noticed, I've changed all my thumbnails so that you can find the material more easily. And Grade 11 Functions is all the purple one and it has a little picture of your textbook in the corner. Okay, let's get going. What makes a relation a function? Okay, so relation just means relationship between two variables. But in order for it to be a function, a relation must have only one y value for every x value. So you would say um, for every x value, there is one and only one value for y. There is one and only one. That's really important. Value for y. That's what makes a relation a function. State whether or not the relation graph below is a function. Justify your answer. Well, you might talk about using a vertical line test, or you might say what you just set up here, that for every x value, there is only one value. Um, you could use, I'm going to say vertical line test. Vertical line test passes for all values. You could repeat, like I said, what was above. So you can see that every time I do a vertical line, I'm only crossing the graph in one place. So yes, it is a function. A little warm-up question for you. Okay, state the domain and range of the graph below. So here it is here. Um, I think on the one that you'll see, you don't have anything drawn there, but it, this is a circle that goes through all the coordinates of three plus or minus three. So Surprisingly enough, this one stumped a lot of my students every time I, I gave this kind of question with a circle. But you know that the domain is the set of all x's such that, whoops, and we're going to look at how far x goes. It goes from minus 3 to plus 3, and it includes those points. So minus 3 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to positive 3, and x is an element of real numbers. Now, for the range, it's the same thing, right? We're going between minus 3 and 3, so it's simply a matter of rewriting the same thing and changing the variable to a y. y is an element of real numbers. So that's to me the range of a circle. Okay, let's move on. Question number 3. A function is defined by... I'm going to move it down. Just hang on. Boop, boop. There we go. Function is defined by f at x equals 3x squared minus 4x and g at x equals x minus 1 over 3. Evaluate f at minus 2. So f at minus 2 means everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a minus 2. Now the best way to do that, of course, is again to use brackets. Everywhere there is an x, that makes sure that you don't make a mistake with the sign of the number. So we have a negative. We want to make sure we're doing a negative times a negative. Okay, so I square minus 2, I get 4, and 4 times 3 is 12, and minus 4 times minus 2 would be plus 8, and that's going to give me 20. Very easy. Whatever you see for x, this is my x here. This is like f at x, right? x is this. Plug it in. What's f at t? Well, I could say, I could put in any variable here. All that means is that I'm going to change the x's to be t's. So 3t squared minus 4t. Oh, that was a nice easy one, Mark. The next one, what is 4f at 3's plus 2g at 4's? So I need to evaluate f at 3 and g at 4 
and I'm going to multiply it by, I'm going to write it all in one big line here. So I'm going to say four times, now f at three. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to plug in a three. So there's my f at three, four times f at three, plus two times g at four. So g at four is going to be four minus one over three. Okay, so you can see how that's 4, f at 3, 2, g at 4. And now I just have to do the math. 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27. So I have 4 times 27 minus 12 is 15. And here I have 4 minus 1 is 3 divided by 3 is 1 times 2 is 2. And that's going to give me 62. Okay, the last one, a little trick here, f at minus 1 minus 2 f at 1s. Okay, so um, some students just like to plug it in and just tell what the answer is. For three marks, you better be showing some work. So f at minus 1 is going to be 3 times minus 1 squared minus 4 times minus 1. That's the first part. I'm going to put it in a big bracket like that. So that's my f at minus 1 minus 2 times f at 1. So f at 1 is going to be 3 times 1 squared minus 4 times 1. Done. All over minus 1 minus 2 times g at 4. So g at 4 is going to be 4 minus 1 over 3, which we just did over here. So we know the answer already. Okay, so I'm going to do this work here. So minus 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3. Minus 4 times minus 1 is 4. So that's 3 plus 4 is 7. And here I have 3 minus 4. 3 minus 4 is minus 1 times minus 2 is plus 2. And then, so we had 3... I just want to make sure I do this right. I have 3 minus 4. 3 minus 4 is minus 1 times minus 2 is plus 2. Looks good. And here I have 4 minus 1 is 3 divided by 3 is 1 times minus 2 is minus 2. And minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3. So 7 plus 2 is 9 divided by minus 3 is minus 3. And there's my final answer. Okay, so now we're going to move on to number four, which says, given the graph of y equals f at x, graph its inverse showing the line of reflection. Now, to remember, the line of reflection is a line that goes through, let me find a ruler, a line that goes right through here. So it's reflected about the line y equals x. So that's like 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. So you can see where I'm going here. So hopefully I hit all the right points here. So here's my line of reflection, y equals x. And now I want to graph the inverse. So I don't have an equation. So what I want to do is I want to find some of the key points on this graph and, and inverse them, right? So if I have this point here, 1, 2, 3, and 3, 3 and 3, well, that just goes to 3 and 3, right? And that makes sense because it is on, on the line of reflection. Okay, let's take this point here. So this is 0 and minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 0 and minus 6 is going to go to minus 6 and 0. That's doing the inverse, right? So minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That point's going to be right here. So this one went over here. Now I'm going to pick this one here, minus 1, 2, 3, minus 4 and 0. So minus 4, 0 is going to 0 and minus 4. So 0 and minus 1, 2, 3, 4. And what else do we have here? So that went here. Um, another good point might be this one here. So 2 and minus 2. 2 and minus 2 is going to go to minus 2 and 2. So you're going to end up with something that goes like this. It's going to go 
around. Now let's take another point. Mm, what's on the line here? How about this one? So minus one and minus one, two, three, four, five. So minus one, I'm going to write it down because I'm going to forget. Minus five is going to go to minus five and minus one. So minus one, two, three, four, five and minus one. So that's bringing me around like this. Now this point here is right on the line, right? That's minus 2 minus 2, so that's still going to be on the line. And we end up with a line going like this and like that. So it looks like a little heart, right? So what you want to do again is you're choosing some points on the original function like I did here. And you're switching them, graphing them, knowing that the reflection line is y equals x. Okay, number five, it says, given the graph of y equals f at x, graph y equals f at 2x plus 6, I'm not on the page here, minus 3. Hint, use the points indicated on the graph as starting points. Okay, so I gave a lot of room here for the students to do this work. So I'm going to, I gave myself some points here on the graph. The, the lines should have been labeled as well. So I have... Um, minus 6 and uh, 5. So the original point here, minus 6 and 5. This one was min minus 2 and minus 1. Minus 2, minus 1. This point here is 2 and 3. And the last point here is 4 and 3. Okay, so I want to know what the transform points are going to be. I also want to give the mapping rule. So when you give the mapping rule, remember, this is one of the kinds of questions that teachers love to give because they want to check to see if you're going to remember to factor out the coefficient of x, okay? There's surely going to be a question like that on your test. So before you begin, write it out properly, factor out that k value right away. So I have x plus 3 minus 3. And now I can see the mapping rule very clearly. So x, remember this one value here, it's 1 over it. So it's going to be x divided by 2. It says plus 3. I'm going to subtract 3. Always remember you do the opposite for the x's, right? They're weird. Looks like 2 times it. You divide by 2, you subtract 3. And the y, here's my minus 1. So it's going to be minus y minus 3 more. Okay, so I have my mapping rule. Now it's just a matter of me finding the transformed points by plugging in x's and y's to find these points. So minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. Minus 3 more is going to be minus 6. Sounds like there's something outside my door. And minus 5 minus 3 is minus 8. So the original point... Um, the x value is still the same. Isn't that weird? Minus 6 divided by 2 is minus 3. Minus 3 is minus 6. Okay, we, we did the right work. So now I'm going to plug in minus 2 here. Minus 2 divided by 2 is minus 1. Minus 3 more is minus 4. And the y value is going to be plus 1. Minus 3 is minus 2. And 2 divided by 2 is 1. Minus 3 is minus 2. And minus 3 minus 3 more is minus 6. And finally, 4 divided by 2 minus 3 is minus 1. And minus 3 minus 3 more is minus 6. That makes sense because they were at the same height before. Okay, so now what you want to do is get a colored pencil. You can find one quickly. And we're going to graph this. So I have minus 6 and minus 8. Minus 6 and minus 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's minus 6 and minus 8. And I have minus 2 and minus 1 went to minus 4. Minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, and minus 2. Right here. And minus 2 and minus 6 now. So minus 2 and minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the last one is minus 1 and minus 6. So here, so it's going to go like this, like this, and like that. Okay, so does that all make sense? Well, it certainly looks compressed horizontally. 
squished this way. Um, there was a reflection, so it was going down before, now it's going up. It's been um, just reflected about that y-axis, shifted down three, and there we go. So we've done everything, we've compressed it, we reflected it, we shifted it down three. Okay, number six. The graph of y equals g at x is transformed into one-third g minus one-third x plus six minus four. Describe all the transformations. Okay, so the first thing we need to show here is that we need to factor out this coefficient, right? Again, the same thing. It was here, it was here. This has to be in brackets. So I leave the one-third g. I factor out a minus one-third. Now, this is where some students have some problems. It's easy to take that out of the x. It just becomes x. But what's plus 6 divided by minus 1 third, you need to remember to invert and multiply. So it's going to be minus 18. Now, once you've done that, you might want to just double check. Minus a third times minus 18 is 18 divided by 3 is plus 6. Okay, so just take that two seconds just to double check. Okay, transformations in the correct sequence. Okay, the correct sequence once it's written like this, it's just reading left to right because it automatically is doing the stretches and compressions first and the reflection. And finally, you're stating the horizontal and vertical shifts. Okay, so remember anything Y is a vertical change. So my first is a vertical compression because it's less than one. Vertical compression by a factor of one third. So that gets rid of this one here, right? There's my first one. The second thing I'm going to talk about is this minus sign here. That's a reflection. If I'm reflecting the x's, it's about the y axis. So reflection about, I'm going to write really fast, about the y axis. Okay, now what is the one-third here? Now you might think it's a compression, but it's going to be a stretch by the factor of three. Remember, one over k. So it's going to be horizontal, because I'm talking about x's. Horizontal stretch by a factor of three. And then you're going to look at the shift. So horizontal shift. This says minus 18, we go to the right 18. So horizontal shift, 18 units, right. And finally, this last little one here, it's going to be a vertical shift down four units. So don't say vertical, don't say down negative four units. That's like a double negative, right? Two negatives make a positive. Okay, so let's move on now, number seven. Okay, so it says determine f negative one x, so that's the inverse of x. If f at x equals x plus two or four, show all steps, then determine the inverse at minus two. I don't think this part was on your test, but that's okay, we'll do it anyway. Okay, so to find an inverse, first thing you want to do is say, let y equal f at x. So let y equal f at x. You can't just start throwing variables around and saying, I'm just going to put it as y. You have to say what you're doing. Okay, so we're going to say y equals x plus 2 over 4. And now we're going to say for inverse, switch variables. Switch variables. And that's why I can say x equals y plus 2 over 4. Okay, you can't just go from here to here with saying what you're doing. I'm taking the inverse. I switch the variables. Variables. Okay, so now I'm going to simplify this, isolate the y. So that's going to give me, and bring it up here, it's going to give me 4x equals y plus 2. And that means y equals 4x minus 2. Therefore, the inverse is... 4x minus 2 and f minus 1 at minus 2 is going to be 
4 times minus 2 minus 2, and that's minus 10. Okay, number 8. Given the coordinates of the graph of y equals f at x below, fill in the following chart. 6 marks. Okay, so I've been given 3 coordinates, and I have this. This is my function. Now again, this one you would probably not have a problem with, but look at this one. It has that minus sign in there. So right away I'm going to make a square bracket here and I'm going to write minus x minus 3 minus 2. Okay, that's, we'll leave that half there just so I see what's going on with the x's. So x and y are going to go to, what do I do to the x's? I have a negative x plus 3. And I ran out of room, but I'll put it just under here. And I have 1 half y minus 2. A half y minus 2. The y's are the easy ones, right? They're sticking right out there for you. Now this one, we don't have to factor out anything because the coefficient of x here is already 1. So x, y, go to, I'm going to write it right underneath so I have more room. So it's going to be x, and I'm going to add 2. And to the y's, I'm going to do 2y plus 1. Okay, so the rest of that is just plugging in the coordinates, right? So I put in a 0 here, that's going to give me 3. Put a 0 here, minus 2. There it is. For this one, 1 and 1. Do I need to do this for you? Probably not. Minus 1 plus 3 is 2. And a half y, 1 half y minus 2. Um... A half, so it's a half, minus two is minus three halves. And I'll just do one of these, for, or a couple of these for this one. So that's just going to be two and one. And if it's one, it's going to be three and three. Ah, let's finish them. So minus two minus three, oh sorry, minus two plus three is one. And four divided by half is two minus two is zero. And for this one, 2 plus 2 is 4, and 8 plus 1 is 9. Okay, filled it in. Number 9, graph f of x equals 3, square root 2, x minus 3. Okay, so I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, okay, um, the k value is already factored out. I don't have to do anything with that. Um, state the domain and range. Okay, I can do that after I graph it. And the key points, x, y, go to, so this means, what is the mapping rule for this part? The key points are going to go in here. So the mapping rule is going to be x, I'm going to divide it by 2, and then I'm going to add 3, and to my y's, I'm going to do 3 times y. There's my mapping rule. Now, what are key points? This one is where some students get mixed up. We want the key points of the parent function. So if I have the graph of the square root of x, which is the parent function for this, all these other numbers are just transformations to the function. So the key points of the root of x, key points for that, well, obviously where it starts, right? Right here, 0, 0. That's going to be my first one. Now the next one I'm going to choose, and I could do 1 and 1, because the square root of 1 is 1. That's a nice one. 1, 1. Now, you're not going to do 2 because the square root of 2 is a root of 2, and that's not a nice number. So let's go to the next perfect square, which would be 4 and 2, right? 4, 2. So I'm going to use 4. Square root of 4 is 2. And then 5, 6, 7, 8. Let's do 9 and 3, right? Square root of 9 is 3. Now, all I have to do is apply this transformation using the mapping rule. So that's going to give me 3, so 0 divided by 2 is 0, plus 3 is 3, and 3 times 0 is 0. So that's going to give me 3 and 0. 1 and 1 is going to go to a half plus 3, that's 3 and a half, or you can put it as 3.5, or you can leave it as a fraction. And 3, I'm going to graph it, so it's kind of nice to use decimals, I think. And 4 divided by 2 is 2, plus 3 is 5, and 2 times 3 is 6. And 9 divided by 2 uh, plus 3 divided by 2 is 4 and a half, plus 3 is 7.5. And uh, 3 times 3. 
9. Okay, so there's my, my four points I'm going to use. And you can tell by looking at this that we have a stretch, we have a shift, and we have a horizontal compression. We don't have any shifts. So like um, vertical shift is what I'm saying here. So 0, 0 went to 3, 0. So here it is. It's starting right here. This is my starting point, right? And now 3 and a half and 3, 3 and a half and 3, 5 and 6, and 7 and a half and 9. So here's my function. It's going like this. Boom. Like that. Okay. State the domain and range. Okay. So now we have, um, when you had the root of x, the domain was x was greater than or equal to 0. Right? That was your domain for root x. But I shifted it to the right. So now the function starts here. So the domain is going to be the set of all x's. x is greater than or equal to 3. And x is an element of real numbers. It's a nice complete solution. My range, well, where does the graph start and where does it go? It doesn't go below here. I don't have any values under y equals 0. But it goes on and on and on and on forever. So that means um, 0 is less than or equal to y. It can be 0. The square root of 0 is 0. The square root of, when I put the 3 in here, it's going to be 0. And um, I don't need a number on this side because it's like infinity, right? Well, it's going to, y is going to be greater than or equal to 0. And y is an element of real numbers. And you're done. That was easy. Five marks. Woohoo, we're winning. We're winning this game called math. And the last question, of course, would be to graph a rational expression. Now, the first thing you need to remember is what is the parent function of a rational function? So the parent is f at x equals 1 over x, right? Remember that? It's just 1 over x. So all these other numbers are transformations. Now, the changes to x are all in the denominator. Now, the way it's written here, 3 minus x, maybe it might be better for you to write it like this. And this is what I always tell my students. And it makes more sense to me as well. If I write 3 minus x, that's the same as minus x plus 3, isn't it? Minus x plus 3. So you can always check. If I put in a 2, 3 minus 2 is 1. Minus 2 plus 3 is also 1. So I didn't make any mistakes there. And finally, the coefficient of x here is a negative. So I'm going to factor that negative out so that I have the correct transformation. And there you go. So my mapping rule is going to be negative x plus 3 negative x plus 3. And for my y, this is all the y stuff here, remember? Okay, so anything, this is y changes. Oh, and I, whoops, I ran out of color here. Oh, oh, let's come back. So this is y here. This is x here. Okay, so do some practice. Those so very important to get the x and y's in the right spot. So I'm going to do 2y, and I'm going to add 5. 2y plus 5. Now, what are the key points of the graph of 1 over x? Well, remember the function goes like this and like this. And the key points here are 1, 1, and minus 1, and minus 1. Those are the most important points on this graph. If you know where they are and you know where the asymptote is, so in the graph of 1 over x, what makes the denominator 0 here is x equals 0, right? x equals 0 is the y-axis. So I'm going to put in these key points here first, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, and I'm going to do the transformation. So I'm going to put in 1 here, that's minus 1 plus 3 is 2, and 2y plus 5 is 7, and minus minus 1 is 1 plus 3, that's going to give me 4, 
and minus 2 plus 5 minus 2 plus 5 is 3. So when I go to graph this now, oh look it says show your asymptotes, even ask you for them right here. What's the x at, what are the asymptotes? So what makes the denominator 0 here would be 3. It has been shifted to the right 3 units, so I move my asymptote to 3. I'm going to use the color again if it works for me. Okay, so here's here's my asymptote x equals 3. All x's on this line are 3. 3, 0, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, right? And key points are now 2 and 7. 2 and 7. There's one right here. And the other one is at 4 and 3. 4, 1, 2, 3. Okay, now we shifted this function up 5. So this value here is my y asymptote. y equals 5. Right here. y equals 5 and x equals 3. And that's nice because once I have these boundaries, I know where this is going. And I know that this is going to approach this way. Now, I could get really fancy here and find the x and y intercepts. Maybe your teacher might ask you to do that as well. So let's try, let's find those asymptotes. So for y intercept, did I say asymptote? I meant intercepts. For y intercept, set x equal to 0. So if I put in 0 here, I get 2 thirds plus 5. So I get. Um, f at x equals, um, what did I say, 5 and 2 thirds, right? 5 and 2 thirds. So if this is 0, 2 thirds plus 5. 5 and 2 thirds. So 5 and 2 thirds right here. So this is going to go right through here. Now if I want to find the x-intercept, for x-intercept, we're going to set y equal to 0, or f at x. So now I have 0 equals 2 over 3 minus x plus 5. I'm going to move the 5 to the other side. I'm going to do all the steps for you. And now I'm going to multiply by 3 minus x on both sides. So minus 5 times 3 minus x equals 2. And that's going to give me minus 15 plus 5x equals 2. I'm going to bring the 15 over here, 5x equals 17, and x equals 17 over 5. And that's going to go in 3, 3, and 2 fifths. My head was already seeing the 2. So 3 and 2 fifths for my x-intercept. So 3 and 2 fifths is kind of about here, right? So I have these asymptotes here, so it's going to go like this, and then it's going to swing around like that. And there you go. There's graphing it, showing the asymptotes, the mapping rule, the key points, and there you go. There's your test. Hope you found it helpful. Give me a thumbs up, leave a comment. I'm always happy to read the nice positive comments that I receive from my watchers. Bye for now.